Our first speaker is going to be Roger W. Robinson. Roger is one of uh, the heroes, as I mentioned, of the struggle with the Soviet Union. Uh, largely unsung hero at that, but uh, nonetheless, he's gone on from there uh, as a senior director for international economic affairs in the National Security Council under President Reagan to uh, launch uh, his own company, RWR Advisory Group, um, he has also served as the chairman of the Congressional uh, Economic and Security Commission, an incredibly important institution for sort of second opinions on what's going on with the Chinese, especially under his uh, distinguished leadership. He is also the chairman of a very highly regarded think tank, which he helped found in Prague, in the Czech Republic, called the Prague Security Studies Institute. He is speaking us, to us today in that capacity. Roger Robinson, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Frank. It's always a privilege to be with, uh, with the home team. Uh, so many recognizable faces uh, from decades of being in the national security space. And it's just a real pleasure to be back with Frank and the team. I would. Uh, we're a little bit constrained on time, and so I'm going to try to move through quite a lot in a short period of time. But as uh, Frank mentioned, uh, we're looking at the economic and financial dimensions of China's hybrid warfare activities directed toward the United States and its allies. As you know, uh, there's a lot of attention to this, fortunately now, from Belt and Road Initiative to Ch uh, Made in China 2025. And as we've gone through step by step, examining these initiatives more carefully, we found that, of course, they're absolutely chock-a-block with strategic content. Indeed, uh, the notion that these are commercial, benign commercial development projects uh, is uh, luckily been largely debunked. And we're dealing with a very ambitious and sometimes insidious uh, set of efforts. We uh, took it upon ourselves to try to look at this in a uh, more uh, <clears throat> granular fashion. And about seven years ago, our firm, and I am representing the Prague Security Studies Institute today, uh, RWR is a more of an impartial data provider. But that said, we, uh, we took it upon ourselves to try to track every Chinese transaction outside of China <coughs> globally on a daily basis. And that data now goes back uh, some six years. Uh, these are not just being tracked, but they're being visually mapped. And so uh, this is what, uh, this is the, uh, I'm sorry, we uh, are a little bit of out of order here, so if I might, I'll see if I can't. Yeah, this is China's uh, global footprint as it exists today, and I mean up to the date. Uh, so uh, it gives you just a quick visual image of where those, uh, the intensity of those dots are located. I don't think there's a surprise, much of a surprise to anyone there. We also try to organize the data in a manner that illuminates uh, specific security related challenges. If I can go back, uh, for example, we were the first company some four or five years ago to identify every Chinese state-owned enterprise doing business in the South China Sea in the building of the illegal islands and militarizing them. And when you look at not just the parent companies, but their networks of subsidiaries, the, and take it, you blow out that global footprint of where they are around the world, this is what you come up with. So as you can see, uh, these companies are well known, uh, they have uh, large global footprints, and, uh, and yet, uh, to my knowledge, there's never been one sanctioned uh, by the United States to date, as dangerous a circumstance as this is. As you know, that water weighs $5 trillion a year in trade, and yet, uh, so far, uh, China's walked without any uh, major penalty. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, what a global footprint of Huawei looks like. Uh, we, uh, we do this in both city views as well as country views. 
Uh, these are the colors or the regions of the world. The number of transactions in, a various, in various countries uh, dictates the size of those bubbles. Um, China Communications Construction Company. This is the largest Chinese entity in Belt and Road. So its footprint is particularly important. Uh, they, are the, uh, they are the dredging company that helped build the islands. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of stories about this. They tried to go to the Hong Kong Stock Exchange for an IPO on a billion dollars. And uh, luckily, we played a role in trying to interdict that deal uh, by the very fact that they were unwilling to disclose their activities in the South China Sea as being controversial and worthy of material risk consideration in the prospectuses. Why? Because, of course, these are illegal activities. They're sanctionable. There's legislation for Marco Rubio and others that's pending right now that could sanction. And yet, CCCC, when they were confronted by the, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, <clears throat> demurred and said, no, no, no. This is the same as Exxon drilling off of New Jersey. There's no controversy here. We're not going to register this as a risk. And finally, with the threat of class action lawsuit, Hong Kong Stock Exchange insisted, and they withdrew the IPO and that billion dollars rather than to have to admit or disclose uh, the fact that they were engaged in disputed, controversial activities. This is important because it gets down to how we're going to help resolve this issue not just through sanctions, but market principles. I mean, what about disclosure, transparency, uh, proper risk management, good corporate governance, uh, protecting of, uh, of share value and corporate reputation? Uh, these are all market principles and tools that we can effectively use to hold Chinese entities accountable as they don't come in, but pour in to our uh, to our debt and equity markets, which is I'm going to be getting to uh, shortly. Uh, so this is just the, uh, the country view of CCCC. I thought it was uh, timely to just take a quick glance of China in Iran. You know, my guess is China has no intention of curtailing its business activities in Iran uh, and its uh, deliveries of oil. It's the largest uh, taker of Iranian oil. I think it's as much as half of their production. So uh, they've made pretty plain that they're not going anywhere. So we're looking at every Chinese company in Iran, all of their subsidiaries, mapping their global footprints because in the event that the Trump administration should decide to actually do something, namely follow through on its threat of secondary sanctions. You know, where are these companies doing business? What kind of leverage do we have? How many of them are doing business in American cities? How many are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or trading over the counter in our markets? I mean, these are going to be relevant questions. This is 21st century war fighting. This, in my judgment, is the sixth domain of American war fighting, namely the economic and financial war fighting domain. Look, at it, look, look for it coming to a neighborhood near you. We've got air, land, uh, we have air, land, sea, cyber, space, but where is the area of our single greatest dominance, the economic and financial domain? They're in our sandbox, we're not in theirs. And yet, we haven't exercised a fingernail of our leverage to curtail their uh, predations and their hostile activities directed toward the United States. So that's just a quick look at Intel Track, and there, there's more to say on that in the way we slice and dice that data. Now, going back quickly, because uh, time is an issue here, uh, to the cap markets, uh, China has uh, about six, over 650 companies in our debt and equity markets today. Maybe around 86 in the New York Stock Exchange, 62 in NASDAQ, well over 500 in the over-the-counter markets. Why? Because, of course, they're less regulated. And uh, you can bet that they're shopping for as little transparency, as little disclosure as they can possibly attain. Now, the, the alarming part of this is that that 
the pace, the sheer pace of the, of the money we're talking about now, we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars moving rapidly toward one trillion dollars. So we're not talking about a few tens of billions here. We're talking about hundreds of billions. Now, it, r it raises a question. Given the fact that the United States has never put up any kind of security-minded screening mechanism over our cap markets, like we have with CFIUS and Firma in the trade portfolio, where at least we're making an effort to vet Chinese investment in the United States to find out who these people are, what are their true intentions, do we have a national security threat there that's worthy? Nothing like that's happening vis-a-vis -vis the cap markets. Never has, and, and that's uh, the root of the problem. So in trying to summarize, and we can perhaps return to some of this in the, uh, in the Q's and A's, there are two major new material risk categories that should properly be focused on. One is national security related risk, and the second is human rights related risk and the abuses there. And I'm thinking about such activities as Hike Vision and its surveillance cameras and equipment that is, uh, that is uh, permeating uh, the detention camps, some would say the concentration camps, are holding a, a million Uyghurs today. When you look at the indexes, like the MSCI, Emerging Market Index, it's tracked by $2 trillion of funds under management. It's mimicked by $14 trillion more. Every time they add a Chinese company, and they're doubling the number in the next 12 months, as much as $14, $16 trillion automatically buy those stocks. Now, you know, some of these companies are major national security and human rights abusers. Uh, take, as I say, Hike Vision on the human rights side, uh, China Unicom, AVIC, China Shipbuilding. In other words, when you look at these companies, and I wanted to describe some of what they do, but I'm already getting the, the sign here from Frank, which uh, I know him too well, which is get out now. That said, perhaps we can return to who these folks are. But let me assure you that those profiles are very troubling. I mean, these are very risky entities on the part of those who look at risk, and they are bad actors in the eyes of those who care about national security and human rights. So I will leave you with uh, there at this time, but leave it to say that we have a real opportunity here if we're prepared to mobilize. This is, remember, this is your money. Uh, all of us are in the, in the markets. Uh, I don't know how many millions, hundreds of millions of Americans, if I mean 180, 200 million Americans have portfolios. We've looked at the public pension systems. We've looked at the mutual funds, the index funds, and so forth. It's not pretty. So wittingly or unwittingly, you're holding bad actors in portfolio. So I'll just leave you with the notion that we all have a right and a responsibility to take action here and call for the kind of disclosure that we need to know as prospective investors. I mean, that's the very least that can be done. And that's not a huge claim. I mean, that's not a huge ask. After all, we're not talking sanctions and market restrictions and trying to damage the competitiveness of our exchanges and all that Wall Street's going to come after us with as they fearmonger you away from this topic. We're looking at disclosure, transparency, market principles, and if we stick with that, it's a very strong suit. Thank you so much.